OK, so the broadcast is now live. We still have two more minutes to go. Interesting. So I don't know whether to keep the uh, the chat room open or the question thing open. There's a question from Madeline Goods asking how he can join the Hangouts. Yeah, I just invited him now because we are still missing two of the people who had seats reserved. OK. Um, I invited Charles Clark a second time, but he he does have he does seem to have problems to join. Maybe he doesn't see the invitation, or maybe he's just uh, watching the live stream. And I can't get the um, the Hangout toolbox running for me. OK, well. So I don't have. Maybe I should just draw something and hold it like this during the talk. <laughs> okay, so it shows two o'clock on my watch now. Um, Welcome back, everyone, after the summer break. It's great to see so many people joining today. And um, I should say that Google have changed a lot of things over the last few months. So it's exciting for me also to see the new functionality here. And let's hope everything is going to work out rather smoothly. So today is also a first because we have uh, a whole conference joining this Hangout. So there's. Um, uh, Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge following us. And I'm also very curious about that and happy. And um, today's speaker is Renato Renna, Professor Renato Renna from the ETH Zurich. And he's going to speak about the uh, reality of the wave function and its relationship to freedom of choice. So this is a very exciting subject. And I'm very thankful to Renato for speaking to us today. Please go ahead. OK, I would like to thank Daniel for inviting me to speak here in this Google Hangout. For me, it's the first time I'm giving a talk without having an, online, uh, without having an audience in the reality here. But I will speak about then the reality of the wave function. So at least that should be real. So I will now change to the screen share. I hope you can now all see my slides. I should mention that this work that I'm going to present here is not available yet on the archive. Um, it's joint work, work with Roger Kolbeck, and we are hoping to get this out soon, whatever that means. So the question we are addressing is whether the wave function is real. And um, I would like to start explaining what that means. So the very rough idea is to view quantum theory as a theory about nature. And we are asking ourselves whether the objects we have in nature are kind of directly mapped into objects of the theory. So more specifically, if you look at an experiment, for example, an experiment where we have a source in which we create a particle and later measure it, then we may assume, it's of course already an assumption, that there is some element of reality associated to that particle. In this talk, I will always call that element of reality lambda. If you don't like the term element of reality, you may just think of lambda as any arbitrary parameter that is somehow relevant to the experiment. Then um, we have on the other side here quantum theory. And here we have, of course, also different objects in general. We have descriptions of measurements. We have descriptions of state preparation procedures in quantum formalism. We have Hamiltonians. 
But in this talk, I will focus just on one aspect of quantum theory, which is the wave function. I should also stress that um, I, assume, I, I use this term wave function in order to stress the fact that it's a pure state. And I will come later um, back to the reason why we want to assume purity of the states here. So the main question is whether the wave function that we see here is related to this lambda, to this general parameter which you may, if you want, interpret as reality. And of course, only with this interpretation the title makes sense, but um, as I said, we will almost nothing, uh, almost assume nothing about this state lambda. So the theorem or the state, the technical statement will hopefully be interesting even if you don't believe in an underlying reality. So of course in an experiment or in what we have is we have somehow an interface between nature and quantum theory. And the interface is experiment, our experiment. So we have some experimental data. We don't have direct access to the objects here, but we have somehow indirect access to these objects um, via procedures that our experimental friends perform in their labs. So for example, what they could do is they create particles, so they have some I, mean, I think of all these values here as knobs, so they have some device and the device has some knobs and depending on the position of the knobs it creates um, a particle in a different state. And then they have some other devices, they also have knobs, for example something they call a measurement device. The measurement device may take this kind of input position of the knob, for example in which basis you want to measure, and then creates an output. And I will stick with this notation, so I will always call a choice that we make, so a knob A or B, and an outcome X or Y. So now we can again go, come back to um, the question and ask how are these related, but there's kind of, you see, a transitive relation. So first of all, nature is somehow related to these experimental data via the experiment, and on the other hand, we have theory that relates the experimental data, more precisely the statistics, to the quantum state that we have um, in the quant usual quantum formalism or the wave function. So this is, um, I will always refer to that as the Born rule because I will not use more from quantum theory than essentially such a Born rule in a slightly more general form, but I will come back to that as well. So now we have a relation from here to here via the experiment and from here to here via the Born rule. And we may now again ask how is now this reality here linked to the wave function. And in particular, we may ask the following question. We may ask whether the wave function, so the mathematical object that we have in quantum theory, is uniquely determined by these parameters here. So again, just think of this as some parameters. And so the, the main result I'm going to show here will be a result about this relationship here. More precisely, I asked the question in a mathematical terms whether there exists a function from here to here. Now this question has been recently um, studied very intensively and I would like to briefly explain why or motivate why it's relevant. So again this is just a, a small picture that illustrates the type of question we are asking. So we are trying to ask whether we can here from these parameters uniquely infer the wave function. Assume that the answer is yes, so if there exists such a function, then what that would mean is, so if something, whatever that is, determines this, then this wave function here is at least as objective as this thing. You may not consider these parameters here as objective, that's um, kind of something I don't even want to um, talk about that, so I don't want to classify the objectivity of that, but I kind of make a relative statement. So I say that if this is a function of this, then this has to be at least as objective as that, because it's just determined by it. Okay, so that's the version of the statement that we will get if there exists such a function. If there doesn't exist such a function, this would mean that the object we consider in theory is not determined by the parameters we have in reality or that are there out in nature. It should somehow suggest that we have here added certain additional aspects that don't occur here, and we may interpret these additional aspects as subjective aspects. 
So, for example, um, if you take as a, a non-quantum scenario here, let's say, the atmos atmosphere, and here this is a weather forecast where we, for example, would say that with 50% probability it is going to rain tomorrow, then clearly I cannot, even if I know all the positions of particles and velocities of the atmosphere, infer what prediction I made here, because the prediction includes the fact that I have only partial information about this. So the fact that I have here a 50% probability about the rain here reflects the fact that I have only partial data from here. So even if I know all the data, I don't know which part of the data this thing is based on. So in other words, a, a probabilistic weather forecast is not determined by um, the state of the atmosphere. So that would be an example where there is no such function. And the example shows that if there's no such function, we have here added some additional aspects, which we may interpret as subjective knowledge or kind of a description of which part of the parameters we know here. So it, we can now go on again and come back to this thing that I already called an assumption. So we could say that assume that there exists something like reality, whatever that is. So if you take this interpretation, then of course what that means is that the wave function is now a function of this reality and therefore itself real. And this again motivates this title. So the title of involving the word reality is kind of based on that assumption. But the more general statement is this one here. So let me briefly reformulate these two claims in a slightly different language, which is used um, in this context very often. Okay, I'll skip that. So this so the state here, the real state or the state of nature may be called the ont or is sometimes called the ontic state. It's of course already an assumption that there is such a thing like an ontic state again. And oh, sorry. And if we call this state an ontic state, then I could again say that um, the wave, what this, if the answer to this question is yes, then the, this would show that the wave function is at least as ontic as this thing. So if this is ontic, then the wave function is ontic. If this is not the case, then I could say that the wave function is a state of knowledge, or in this terminology, one would call it an epistemic state. Now, this looks as if there are two variants, but let me stress that it's maybe better to think about three variants that we have. And I have here just some faces of people who kind of advocated certain views that are possible here in this scenario. So one view is that the wave function represents our knowledge about an underlying reality. So this assumes that the thing we had on the left, the lambda, is indeed existent and is real. And this will be implied if, in this case, if the wave function was a function of this reality. This, um, oh, sorry, um, I was wrong. So this would, this statement here, the wave function presents our knowledge, would mean that and the wave function is not a function of these elements of reality. This would be the other case that I already explained where it is a function. And this would be the case where we just don't make any assumption about existence of reality. So then we could say, still interpret the wave function as subjective if there is no such lambda. And this is a point of view that has been um, advocated by people in particular, also from our community. Um, I've had recently emails from Chris Fuchs who stressed that he is, for example, um, taking this point of view. So this question has already also recently been um, in the news, and for a very good reason, because um, this was there was a recent theorem proposed by Pussy Barrett and Rudolph, who um, made that, I would say, who were somehow the first to make a precise claim answering that question. So they have a theorem that states that indeed, under certain assumptions, the wave function is a function of this lambda here. Um, let me use this opportunity to um, highlight this word or this paper here. It's actually an article in, um, in the Quantum Times by Matt Liefer, um, which explains the result very nicely. So what is now the goal of my talk? So my the talk, so the goal is not to explain this result again, but um, the goal is to reconsider the assumptions, and in particular, 
the goal of the work is to try to weaken the assumptions. Whether this will succeed is um, up to the judgment of you, but I will try to present the assumptions in such a way that it's clear in which sense the assumptions we make are different from the assumptions that are made in this theorem here. I should also stress that the assumptions that I will mention here are different from earlier work that I have done with Roger Kolbeck. Um, in some way, they are a subset of the assumptions of the earlier work. So the very rough idea in what sense we want to weaken the assumption is the following. So this is um, a short description of the assumptions that go into the theorem of Husserl Barrett Rudolph. And those who are familiar with the theorem will already notice here that I formulated the assumptions slightly differently, but I will um, explain more precisely how they're related to the way it's formulated in the original paper. But the reason for this formulation is that I can now compare them one to one to our assumptions. So on the right hand side, you see the assumptions we have. And essentially, the main difference is that we try to get rid of one assumption here. So again, for those who are familiar with this, let me stress this that um, these two assumptions here that are called F and PR, so F stands for free choice and PR for product form, are usually summarized in one assumption that is sometimes called independent preparation assumption. And I will explain later how this assumption um, is, is formulated precisely in mathematical terms and how this assumption implies these two assumptions that uh, correspond to the assumptions we make. I will discuss these assumptions in more detail, so don't worry at the moment to, um, about the exact formulation. This is just an outlook slide to tell you that we will try to get rid of one assumption if we formulate it in these terms. So the structure of the theorem, again, is just we have certain assumptions, and under these assumptions, this, there exists this, this function here. And I should also mention in this context that, of course, these assumptions, or some of the assumptions, are necessary. There is recent work um, which shows that if we drop this so-called independent preparation assumption, which would mean that we drop here this one and this one, then it's no longer true that there exists such a function. Okay, so what I'm going to do now in the next half hour is essentially to show you what these assumptions here mean and also in what sense we can get rid of one part here that was used before. And um, let me also now already say that I think I'm, I'm really a, somehow a big fan of this theorem because for the, when I learned of this theorem, this was the first time I realized how such a question is formulated in precise terms. I was before already aware of the discussion of the debate about the reality of the wave function, but it's very nice to see that one can actually put that in the form of a theorem. And that's why I, um, me and I guess also Roger were very interested to work on that and to try to see to what um, extent we can kind of um, strengthen or in some way weaken the assumptions and therefore strengthen the result further. Let me briefly remind you for, or tell you for those who don't know the PPR theorem what happens there. So I will here directly um, present the channel version. So there is also a version with only two preparation devices but to get the general claim for arbitrary states, you need n of them. So what they do is they prove the theorem in a re relate, I mean, they relate, or they consider a certain experimental setup. It's similar to a bell type theorem, where we also have a certain experimental setup with measurements and so on. And I describe it here in, in the following way. So we have n sources, and each source has an op in which, which allows us to prepare one out of two states. So this is denoted here by an input. So the input is somehow a wave function. But for the particular experiment they consider, we have just a choice out of two inputs. This will be similar in the theorem that I'm going to present later. So we have these choices here. And then the source creates, for example, a particle. And the particle may now, again, have associated parameters, some underlying real state or ontic state, but it's just some parameter. And then later you measure the whole thing jointly. This measurement in the general case is described in the PBR paper by a certain quantum circuit and then by a product measurement. But if you want, you can just think of this as one big 
joint measurement on all n particles. So the important thing is that, and just to um, prepare you to the discussion of the assumptions, that here, of course, we need to make certain choices, as I said. So we choose a wave function, or we choose wave functions from a certain set of wave functions. And then at the end, we consider measurement outcomes. And the theorem will, of course, use certain facts about these measurement outcomes and then make a statement about these lambdas. In particular, it will, as I said, make the statement that these lambdas are functions of, of these wave functions here. Now, the assumption, the last one I mentioned, the one we have tried to get rid of is the following. It's an assumption which I call here PR for product. It's that if the assumption says that if I prepare a system in a product wave function, so which would be, for example, the case if I just choose here a state independently and here independently, then the assumption is that the underlying state that is denoted by lambda has also product form. So this is, the, is not the full independent preparation assumption. This is just only a part of it. This is only a, um, the part that tells us something about the structure of lambda. There is an additional assumption which also says that these values have, are distributed, have a certain distribution, namely a product distribution. But for the moment, I just assume that the states here have product form. This is the part, this part of the assumption. Now, to compare what we consider is a different experimental setup. The so experimental setup we consider is the, the one depicted here. So you have a choice of a wave function. It's again, as before, um, you will have a choice between two different wave functions that can be arbitrary, but for each um, run of the experiment, you consider a choice between two. And then a source prepares the wave function. Then um, um, the system undergoes a certain unitary. And here, I mean, it's kind of the opposite of what PBR do. So here, the unitary, I mean, maybe I should go briefly back. So here, the unitary somehow collects all these particles and makes a joint measurement on them. However, here we have one system and split it into two and measure it at two separate locations. These A and B are choices of measurements. So we choose how to measure this at the time of the experiment. So, okay. Just again, brief repetition, we have this choice of state, we have a choice of measurement, and here we have measurement outcomes. Now the big difference, and this is the, um, let's say, the, the main um, improvement we are trying to make is to get rid of the assumptions that we have a product state. So as you see, we have here just one big parameter lambda. There's no structure in it. So there's no lambda one, lambda two, and so on. And this lambda may be interpreted as the state underlying physical state of what is created by the source, but this is not necessary. It may just interpret lambda as a completely arbitrary parameter, but of course we will now go make certain assumptions about it, but these assumptions have nothing to do with whether this is now a parameter that is associated to certain particles here. It's just general assumptions about um, the lambda, in particular about its completeness. Okay, so what is the main result? The main result is a theorem, which I first state informally, and I will later give a um, precise mathematical formulation. The main result um, is, again, the result that there exists a function from this lambda to phi in the experimental setup that we had under the following assumptions. So the first assumption is that the one that I already mentioned briefly, that the Born rule is valid. This is just somehow necessary to even give a meaning to that state. Then the second assumption is that we can choose the parameters freely. So you remember that I choose a wave function and I choose how to measure it. And this is an assumption that I will discuss in much more detail. Then the third assumption is also important. This is the assumption that, and it's the, by the way, the only direct assumption about this lambda, it's that this lambda is in some sense a complete description of the experiment. So this is, by the way, the only assumption that excludes, for example, the trivial situation where lambda is just a constant. If lambda is just a constant, which doesn't depend on the wave function at all, then it clearly cannot determine the wave function. So this is somehow the assumption that 
makes establishes a link between lambda and the actual experimental run. And I will also explain what that means. Okay, so let's go through these assumptions. In order to understand the assumptions, it's probably useful to keep in mind the experimental setup we have. However, I would like to emphasize that the assumptions are formulated in a, or we try to formulate them at least in a generic way. So by generic, I mean that I don't um, make any statements that are specific to this particular experimental setup. I would like the assumptions to be applied to any other experimental setup as well, or at least to make sense in another experimental setup. Whether they then lead to the same conclusion is a different question, but I, I want the assumptions to have a general meaning, and not only a meaning for a particular experimental setup. The other important thing is that the assumptions are supposed to be operational in the following sense. Um, they are just all statements about the statistics of these values that you see here. But um, th this includes this value lambda. So if you think that this lambda is not accessible, then it's not operational in that sense. It's just operational in the sense that if you had access to all values depicted here, then you could, in principle, verify all assumptions experimentally. The second um, remark is that, and this is, has to do with this aim of formulating the assumptions generically, that I don't at this stage, when I formulate the assumptions, make any distinction between choices of a measurement or choices of a state. Because, you see, from an operational point of view, these are just devices, and the device has a knob. And what that means here, what I meant by drawing this, is that I somehow choose the position of the knob to be A, and then the measurement device does something. And here I choose the knob to be a certain um, a value corresponding to the preparation of a wave function, but this is just an op with, for example, two possible positions, and this is an op as well. And the distinction that we make between some device being a measurement device and the device being a source doesn't really make sense on, an oper on a completely operational level. In particular, if you want, I could say that here I prepare a state, and this state is fed into the measurement device, and depending on the state, that I feed here into the measurement device, the measurement device is performing a different measurement on this particle. So I can always choose the knob or choose to call the knob position a state that I also feed into the measurement device. So in this sense, um, it doesn't make sense to really make distinctions between choices of measurement settings and choices of states on this operational level. Of course, in quantum theory, it makes a difference, but not if I'm in an experimental lab. I don't distinguish different knobs knobs for measurements and knobs for preparations. So that's an important remark to understand the motivation behind the assumptions. So let me now go through the assumption. So the first assumption doesn't probably require much discussion. It's that the Born rule is valid. So in this particular setting, it just means that the quantum state that is measured here, which is of course the state after the whole thing underwent is unitary, um, gives rise to a certain distribution, and this distribution is given by this um, product of kets and projectors. So these Pix are projectors. So I assume that for any fixed value of A, so capital letters here mean that this is a random value that I could choose, and the small letter means I look at the particular value here. So this is now the distribution for a particular value A, and the particular choice of B, and the particular choice of phi is given by the projectors corresponding to this particular outcome x and the particular outcome y, and because it's a product measurement in quantum theory, I, I have here a product projector, and this is applied to the state after it underwent this evolution here. So I think this is probably completely undisputed. This is how we do quantum theory all the time, and this is, by the way, of course, exactly the same assumption that is also used in most other theorems in this context, including, for example, the PBR theorem where this, however, this unitary is kind of doing the opposite. As I said, it takes many particles and then makes one out of it. Okay, so I don't want to discuss this any further. I would just to mention that without such an assumption, it wouldn't even make sense to talk about the wave function because this is the only assumption that gives a meaning to the wave function, an operational meaning. The other assumptions are a little bit um, harder um, to convey, and I would like to um, this prepare this discussion 
by introducing something that I call a chronological order. So let me first stress that here this is not an assumption that I'm making. This is just a mathematical construct that I'm introducing and which is from a technical point of view just a pre-order relation. A pre-order relation is a binary relation between random variables in this case which is reflexive and transitive. So when I draw this, this means for example that there is also a relation between this phi here and A from here to here. And there's also a relation from here to here, but there's, for example, no relation from A to Y. So at this point, as I said, there is no assumption behind it. However, what it should reflect is somehow our intuition in which order we carry out the experiment. So somehow it's clear that we first choose the wave function before we, set the out we see the outcome X and before we see the outcome Y. Furthermore, the, this, this order tells us that there is no definite order between when we make the choice A and when we get this outcome Y. So this is not necessarily in the future of that. And, will, um, and what, so one way to imagine what this should mean, but this is just one choice, is to think of it as um, if we have an arrow from A to X, this means that X lies in the future light cone of A. So that's a possible um, way to link or to establish such an order given a certain experimental setup. But let me stress again that so far I haven't made an assumption. However, the assumptions I'm going to make will refer to this particular order here. And you see, um, if I draw here different boxes, it of course means something for the assumptions. If, and as you will see, so, and this is reflected by this order here. Um, so the fact that I have no arrow from A to Y is somehow in this picture just reflected by the fact that I drew, draw here a box around that and the box around that. Let me maybe briefly go back and, and, um, to this um, PPR setup. Here I also have different things. This will mean that I have, for example, here um, no ordering between this and that. So this has to be done before this and this before this and this before this, but these things here are separate. So that will also be um, represented by a similar um, chronological order. Okay, so let's now work with this chronological order as an example. Now let me define what I mean by free, a free choice, or more precisely I should call it free randomness, because free choice always feels like a little bit like free will. However, it's all about randomness. So the question is um, how, how, what is the distribution of a va value with by which I choose a certain measurement setup. So I call a choice free if it's independent of anything that does not lie in the future of A according to this chronological order. And in addition, I also require that um, this distribution of the value that I choose has full support. So this somehow means that when I do an experiment, I mean, of course, I have to define a set when I say full support. So I have a certain set of possible choices of a knob. And this thing then tells me that the positions of the knob can in principle be chosen at random in such a way that each position is chosen at least with a non-zero probability. This is what this here says. And in addition, and this is the non-trivial part, I choose the position of the knob independently of everything else. But of course I have to restrict this everything else because when I turn a knob, the knob will of course have some consequences in the future. So I have to exclude all things that are in the future. And this is now how this chronological order comes in. So only together with this, this is, um, we have an assumption. So the assumption is this thing here. We will assume that the choices we will make are free with respect to such a chronological order. I will um, motivate this order or this thing later in more detail, but let me also now talk about completeness. So another assumption was completeness. So this again refers to a chronological order. So what does completeness mean? A value lambda is said to be complete if everything that is in the future, so this lambda plus are all values that, that are in the future, are, per, are um, maximally well predicted by lambda. So this, what this equality here says that if in addition I take certain things into account from the past, 
then I cannot improve the predictions of things in the future. So everything that I can say about future things is already contained in Lambda and doesn't require any additional information. So this is, um, in some way, as I said, um, necessary to make sure Lambda is not the constant. So it somehow tells us that Lambda, so if Lambda is complete, it, it tells us something non-trivial about the future, and not only something non-trivial, it tells us everything about the future we can possibly know. So even if you take into account other information, we will not learn more about the future. So that's what completeness means here. And again, I need to talk about future and past, and this is why I need a certain order. But the order is always very naturally given by the experiment. Now, um, I hope it's a little bit clearer what um, the assumptions now mean. So um, again, the Born rule is probably pro completely unproblematic. Then what I assume are, are, is now that A and B, the choices of measurements, are free with respect to this chronological order. So this means that if I choose A, A has to be independent of everything except this X. And if I choose B, it has to be independent of everything except this Y. And that lambda is complete means in this case just that if I, in addition, consider the wave function, I cannot better predict these measurement outcomes than if I don't. So lambda should contain all information that is relevant for the predictions that is contained in the wave function. So now we are kind of ready maybe for a, a precise formal statement. And I show this just to make clear that there is really a mathematical version of the theorem. So the theorem says the following. So this is the same theorem as before. It's just formulated more precisely. So I choose two states. Phi and phi prime. These are kind of the two choices I make here. And these states should not be perfectly parallel. Otherwise, I will, it doesn't make sense kind of to, um, to determine it, because they are kind of physically, in that case, the same states. So there are two um, non-parallel states. And now I'm saying there exists an isometry and measurement. So this just means there exists an experimental setup of the type before, such that something, and this something is what I said before, the main claim, holds for whatever distribution I assume here. So you see, the statement is technically a statement about the joint probability distribution of random variables. It's like a Bell theorem. Bell theorem is also, at the end, a statement about joint probability distribution of random variables. The same is true here. And I now make certain assumptions about this distribution, and then also make a conclusion about this distribution. So the assumption about the distribution is, first of all, a trivial one, namely the one that is kind of implied by this. I, I want to have a choice between two states. So the support of the distribution should be such that I choose both states. I could also have said here that phi should be chosen free. And then um, I make these assumptions that I explained before. And then there exists this function such that this holds. So here is the, the whole structure. So this also makes clear that um, the experimental setup has to depend on the choice of the states. But this is not problematic. This is true for all other theorems of that type as well. OK. So just to be a little bit more precise, so you see, if I phrase this out, this is really just a technical statement about the distribution, this Born rule statement. The same is true here. This is just a technical statement about um, a conditional probability distribution. This says that the value of A conditioned on these values um, should um, be the same as just the distribution of A. So in other words, A is independent of these values. This is, I mean, and the same should hold for B, of course. I didn't write that here. And this is this completeness statement that says that if I add the wave function, I don't get any better predictions about X and Y. And of course, I don't need to predict A and B because there are anyway random choices. But this is technically part of the assumption. So let me now come back and, and see how this all compares to and the known original theorem of Husserl, Barrett, and Rudolf. So of course, they also make certain choices, as I said. And um, we can now ask ourselves, what is there any assumption in this theorem about these choices? And in order to compare the theorem, let me again say you will not find this formulation of the assumption in the paper. But in order to compare the theorem to ours, I would like to just um, state an implication of the assumption they make. So I'm also not claiming that what I'm saying now is necessary to prove their statement. It's just an implication. So it's something that it is 
certainly implied by their, or it's, it's, it's certainly weaker than the assumption that they already make. So I could, if I look at their setting, and this setting here I, is the same as what I draw here. If I look at this setting, then there are also different devices. And so it's natural, and that's probably what they also meant, to um, consider a chronological order where you first choose the state, and then the source prepares something. And here is choose a state, and the source prepares something, and so on. So I could reflect that by this chronological order. But by itself, this doesn't tell us anything. But now, if I choose this as the chronological order, I can, of course, use the definition of a free choice. And what I now find is that what and PPR calls an independent preparation means that, for example, this phi 1 is independent of gamma 2. So, and all the other gammas and all the other phi's. And this can now be formulated or rephrased in terms of free choices by saying that these things here, the choices of the wave functions, are free with respect to this particular chronological order. So it's important that there is, for example, no arrow from here to here, because this would mean that this gamma or lambda 2 could depend on, on this, but that they want to exclude that. So the independent preparation thing implies free choice for this particular chronological order, which is a similar order that we have, but this is why I stress that I don't want to make a distinction between choices, between knobs that mean the preparation of a state and knobs that mean the setting of a measurement. But of course, the, an, a difference, if you want to make this distinction, is that their free choice applies to choices of states, whereas our free choice applies to choices of measurement settings. And if you want to put that in, onto the same, in the same terminology, we would need to look at measurement devices that first take a state that is prepared and then perform a measurement depending on that state. Okay, let me come back to this free choice assumption because that's usually the point that um, is discussed um, very emotionally. There have also been there has also been a discussion on the archive because we used this assumption also in previous work. So this is again just a restatement of the assumption um, or of of the definition more precisely. And um, so I should um, maybe also mention here and that this is not an invention of, um, that is kind of just made for this particular theorem. It's somehow inherent in a lot of work, but it's a little bit disputed what Bell meant by free choice. But one statement which comes closest to this is the following, which you find in this work here. He once said that when he talked about free variables, that this means that the values of such variables have implications only in their future light codes. And if you now interpret this arrow here as being the causal future in, with respect to light cones or with respect to relativity, then this um, is somehow um, a possible formalization of what he said here. But I don't want to insist on, on that he really meant that. I just want to um, mention that there is a certain relationship between these things. However, what I would like to insist on is that this definition is in principle falsifiable. So um, what did I mean by that is that if you define this arrow as the causal future with respect to relativity theory, then it means that um, if a choice or an, a value A was not free according to this definition, then there exists a reference frame in which some value exists that is correlated to the choice before the choice is made. And if I find such a value, I would have therefore falsified the free choice assumption. Let me now briefly come to the proof of the theorem. I will only give a proof, very short proof sketch, but um, I, I hope that it will, I will convey the main idea behind it. So first of all, I have to say how this setup is built up. So I always said there is some unitary and there are certain measurements. So specifically what we do is to choose a unitary depend, depending on these states here such that after the unitary the states have a particular form. You see, the, the, if I prepare here the state phi, then after the unitary these two particles should be in this particular state, which is essentially just a superposition, I mean it's essentially a, a d-dimensional Bell state. Um, then 
um, if I prepare the system in this state, there has to be another state. Probably you don't see at the moment why this is useful to have this state, but importantly here, one thing is important, namely that this state has only overlap, so psi prime has only overlap with psi on elements smaller or equal to, or smaller than, strictly smaller than k. And d will usually be larger than k. So these states have kind of an overlap on the first k minus one um, basis vector. So these are just some, this is just some more normal basis. I forgot to say that this chance here. Now, a first step of the proof, which I'm not I'm explaining here, but it's not hard to do that, is to verify that whatever choices of states I make here, I can always find the unitary end parameters d, k, and psi, such that after the unitary I have these two states. Okay, so that's, we can now continue working with these states, because at this stage we have these two states depending on the choices here. Now the measurement here is a measurement, and this is now um, in um, also the relation to earlier work I did with Roger Kolbeck. This is some um, measurement that is used, is also um, used in the context of chained Bell inequalities. I don't now want to specify these measurements explicitly, but the idea is the follow, or what we need, what we use about these measurements is the following property. If you apply the measurements to this particular state that I defined before, so if I make this choice phi, the state after the unitary will be psi, and if I now apply the measurement to this state, I will get an outcome distribution which has this form. It's essentially a uniform distribution, even if I condition on this additional parameter lambda. This is a non-trivial statement, and the proof of this statement is, however, already um, present in earlier work. So this relies on this assumption that the Born rule is correct, because it's, of course, a statement about the distribution of measurement outcomes, and it relies on the assumption that A and B are chosen freely, because this is here, you see, depending on the choices. So I'm not going to explain this step, but you can read this in this earlier work. Um, but what we are going to use next is that we now know what the distribution of x conditioned on the choice of this state and conditioned on, on, the, on the value of lambda. And this is true for all a. So this is what I had before. I just copied it here. Now we assume by contradiction that the wave function is not the function of this lambda. So this is what we want to prove. But we assume now by contradiction it's not true, which means in different terms that there exists a particular value lambda such that for two different wave functions, phi and phi prime, I have a positive probability of getting this lambda. Now, um, so um, I have also this assumption, see the completeness. And the completeness means that lambda completely determines everything I can predict about the outcomes, which means that this distribution here cannot depend on the wave function. So in particular, I can replace this phi here by a phi prime and should still get the same value here for the probability distribution. This is just completeness. This just is implied by the fact that lambda has all information already included that is relevant for predicting x. And what I need is only that this is strictly positive. This also implies, of course, so if this is strictly positive for at least one value lambda, and there exists such a value lambda, this also means that if I drop lambda, this conditional distribution of x is positive. So I will have, with some probability, a, a positive value for, um, for a particular outcome here. So we have this. However, and this is now the only place where this state, this strange-looking state that I had before um, is used. And I don't want to show you the state again. The only thing I want to maybe remind you of is that this state had no component in the k um, so in this basis, there was no k vector. So this was defined in such a way. So in other words, if I measure this state phi prime or psi prime directly, psi prime is the state that comes after the, that comes out of the unitary evolution applied to phi, then this value must have probability zero. So this is by construction the case. But this, of course, contradicts this and therefore leads to a contradiction. So therefore, the assumption that we make here, made here by contradiction that phi is not the function of lambda is wrong, and therefore we have proved the zero. So, admittedly, I have now skipped over many steps. Just to summarize, I've, I've here um, 
assumed certain states and then I have as um, used this result of before, but this is just a technical lemma. This is not the full result of this paper. This is one technical lemma of the paper. And um, then um, this is again the part that should have been clear more or less. So are these assumptions necessary? Um, I said already before that the Born rule is necessary, otherwise there's just no meaning in phi. Also, it's of course necessary that we somehow choose certain things and independently of other things. Of course, which chronological structure I use depends on the actual context, but that, that I have at certain places free choices is necessary because otherwise the world could just be deterministic. And if I was in a completely deterministic world, I could have, um, I could, for example, take as a, um, as a value, for example, the outcome of a measurement, x. And clearly I know that from the outcome of the measurement, from x in our notation, I cannot determine the wave function. Then um, this assumption here is, as I said, um, used in order to make sure that this underlying parameter is not, for example, a constant or has nothing to do with the physical setup. So this really tells us that this lambda should have information about the outcomes. So in this sense, I cannot completely drop any of these assumptions. What is possible is still to weaken them, probably, but if I drop any of the three assumptions, then the theorem is just wrong. There is no such function. So, um, okay, I already explained that. I will want to skip over that. Um, I will already now come to the discussion and um, maybe a short outlook. And I would like to pose a challenge. So this um, free choice assumption that we make has been discussed very emotionally, as I said. And I think it's very interesting to um, kind of compare it to other similar definitions of what the free choice means. Unfortunately, however, I haven't seen a different definition of free choice which satisfies the following two assumptions. So um, one of assumptions is, of course, that if we define free choice, it should somehow be compatible with the intuition that there's something that is unpredictable. So this is about randomness. So I want the randomness. So if I make a measurement at random, then um, the measurement choice should not be predictable. Here I'm, of course, not precise what predictable means, but it should be, I mean, I'm referring here to some intuition. The second thing is a more stringent requirement. What I would require from a definition of free choice is that it's not too specific. So, of course, if I look at, for example, a Bell setup, I can just define that um, a certain random variable has to be independent of another one and that I call this a free choice. However, I would like, I would prefer to have a definition of free choice that can be applied to any experimental setup. So if I turn a knob somewhere, I want to be able to define what it means to turn that knob at random. Whether I can really do it in practice is then a different question. But I would like to have a definition which, when I go to a lab, which I can apply there and ask myself, is, what does it now mean to make a free choice when I turn a knob? So the, the definition has to be generic. And that makes it a little bit harder to define it. So I need so, to assume a certain structure. And so the challenge is to come up with a different definition, maybe a weaker one, which is generic in that sense, and still captures something that would, we would intuitively call um, free randomness. And I haven't seen such a thing, and, um, but I would be very curious to see such an alternative definition. Because people are usually saying this definition is somehow bad, but it's easier to argue if there is an alternative. Okay, so this is again a technical summary. Um, so this is just the theorem. From now slowly to the conclusions of this talk. So the theorem is that I hope it's clear that um, or what, that it's a technical statement about probability distributions. So that's the important thing. It's not um, there's no hidden things about let's say for example what it means for something to be real. It's just a statement about a lambda that satisfies this definition of being complete. And whether you now call it reality or not is up to you. This is the non-technical summary. So what we have shown is that under these three assumptions, which are kind of assumptions that I can now link to this picture that I showed you before, namely that I have somehow a complete description of nature, that I can freely choose um, not positions, and that the statistics of measurement outcomes follow the Born rule, then the wave function is 
indeed a function of this complete description here, of this complete parameter. Okay, that brings me already to the end. Um, as I mentioned, I hope to have a preprint out soon. Um, I should also <laughs> maybe um, mention here that it's my fault that it's not already ready. Roger already had prepared that more than, I guess, three months ago. And in the meantime, nevertheless, there's some literature of Roger and myself that is related to this particular statement. There's, of course, much more literature by other people, but these are the papers that are most closely related to the result I've presented here. So many thanks for the attention, and I'm now happy to take questions. Great. Thank you very much, Renato, also on behalf of all the others, because you can't hear them clapping. Um, so we're now getting ready for questions. I should say that we have uh, constantly almost uh, 40 viewers for this hour uh, on the live stream, which I think is a record so far, so I'm very happy about this. Um, and if you're watching the live stream, you can simply ask questions by putting them in the thread and we will bring them into the hang Hangout. Uh, for those of you who are in the Hangout, in, in, the, in the live Hangout, um, please uh, let us know in the chat that you would like to ask questions and we can then um, put the microphone to you. Maybe I will start by a question that comes from the, from the, uh, from the live stream, actually, and it's by Peter Lewis. And it says, um, can you say a bit more about the role of the unitary? Couldn't you just prefer, prepare a different phi or do different measurements? Does the unitary depend on the states you want to show? Um, have no mutually compatible ontic states? Thanks. I guess you answered a little bit about that because you, you gave the definition of the unitary later. But um, if, you, if you have something to say about that, that would be good. OK. Um, maybe I show briefly the slide again. OK, so um, the reason why I have this unitary here is that I would like the theorem to be applicable to any choice of states that I um, have here. And so I don't want to assume that these states are taken, for example, from a product state. I just have some arbitrary space, some arbitrary Hilbert space and two states in that space. And however, for the technical argument to work, I need to um, have two different measurements applied to two different parts of a product space. So I somehow need to map that thing into that. So it's needed for the technical argument in order to make sure that I need, don't need by assumption or in order to make sure that I don't need to restrict the theorem to be valid only for particular states on a product space. So in some way, if I maybe show the formal theorem, then what I want on this formal level is that here you can choose arbitrary two states. So these are two arbitrary states in an arbitrary Hilbert space, only subject to this condition. And the technical argument requires now that I work with states on a product space. And so the unitary does that for me. So it's necessary to include it here in order for the technical argument to work and in order to make sure the theorem is is general. Um, maybe I should say that um, if you look at, for example, the PBR result, there you see that the measurements also depend on the choice of the states. So maybe the unitary here has a similar role to the choice of measurements that they um, have to consider in the PBR result. And indeed, in, in this result, if you look at the full version of the result, you see that they actually formulate it also in terms of a unit or of a circuit. So they say that for any two states they have, there is a certain circuit, which would be that unitary, and measurements such that the statement holds. So that's my answer to this question. I'm not sure I answered it because I don't see any reaction. But No, you can't, you can't see any reaction because it was on the live stream. OK. Uh, thanks very much. So I pass on to Matt Liefer, who had the next question. OK, thanks. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask um, how the assumptions in this particular version of the theorem are related to the, so you had an earlier paper which based on I your see. more sort of general theorem um, yes. proved the reality of the wave function. So it, is, is there a sense in which the assumptions here are weaker than that, or, or is it mm -hmm. the same assumptions 
OK, thanks a lot for asking this question. I should actually have mentioned that. Um, so indeed, the assumptions, I mean, the reason for this whole work is that the idea is that these assumptions are strictly weaker than the assumptions we had in our previous work. So the previous work was essentially a concatenation of two results that led to a similar statement. And one of the results was that um, the quantum theory, or we call that non-extendability of quantum theory, which is a result that says that um, if I have a parameter lambda, um, as here, which satisfies certain conditions, then um, this, this lambda cannot improve the predic predictions um, that are already possible when I know the wave function. So in other words, the result said that the wave function is in some way maximally informative um, among all um, possible additions which satisfy certain assumptions. But these assumptions that had to be satisfied by this lambda were these assumptions here plus an additional assumption that we called in that work QMB, which had to do with the way measurements are carried out. So essentially the additional assumption we needed was that all measurements are on a larger Hilbert space unitaries. And um, that assumption was also a little bit hard to formulate because um, it somehow um, involves um, saying something about, let's say, the space outside the actual experimental setup. So we somehow say when we do an experiment, we could always equivalently describe it by unitary on a larger setup. This assumption is no longer needed for this work. So in this sense, it's strictly weaker than the concatenation of the previous result with, uh, um, or this previous result that I mentioned before. So the non-extendability of quantum theory um, leads to that statement, but it's kind of a detour in some way. And this detour, the price you pay for the detour, is an additional assumption um, which is now dropped. OK, thanks. Uh, I won't ask any other questions right now, because uh, otherwise we'll get into an emotional debate on the free choice assumptions. So let's uh, <laughs> okay. move on to somebody else. OK, so the, the next person who had the free choice to ask the question is Mark Wild. OK, so uh, the first question is, can we ask two questions? Um, <laughs> so I'm just wondering about the properties of this function. In your prior work, uh, there's a sense in which it's one-to-one, -one, like in one-to-one -one correspondence, mm -hmm. the, the, the wave function and the parameters. But you didn't mention anything about that here. So I'm, I'm wondering about that. Yes. OK, that, that's a, um, this question is very closely related to the question we had before. But thanks again. Or thanks also for asking it, because it's a different aspect. So indeed, so what this result that I mentioned previously shows, um, so this non-extendability of quantum theory is that um, all predictions I can make based on the wave function are already maximally informative. So there is no lambda which adds something to it, which then implied that indeed from knowing the wave function, I can also get lambda. So I have also relation in the other direction. Um, and so um, here, I just make a relation from here to here. Now, I could also get the other relation if I added this assumption to this set of assumptions that I mentioned before. So there is some additional assumption I could add, add to this, which is which we called QMB, which is the assumption that measurements are unitaries on a larger space. So with this additional assumption, I would have indeed a one-to-one -one relation. The goal of this work was kind of to get only this part of the relation, but with minimal assumptions. That's why I didn't want to add that here. So somehow, you have the choice between adding something, which is, however, quite debatable, because um, I guess most of the criticism about this earlier work about the non-extendability of, um, of the um, wave function was um, related to this additional assumption we had. So the idea was to drop this additional assumption and get only a statement in one direction here, which is um, then hopefully cleaner. So that's the answer to that first question you had. <laughs> 
So in other words, summarizing, add an assumption to this, and then you get a one-to-one -one relation. And if you don't want to add the assumption, you have only a function from here to here. Okay, I have the, the feeling that Mark's video is frozen at the moment, so yes, I'll so. pass on to Cambridge for the moment. Cambridge, your microphone is switched off, I think. saying that the probability of A is independent of big gamma defined as the W which are not in the future of A. But it seems that one could take a smaller set for gamma, namely the W that aren't in the future of A and they are not in the past of A, because it looked like the proof just uses W space like to A not having any influence on the probability of A. So my suggestion would be that one could slightly weaken the same process. Actually, I don't think the probability of A should be independent of events that lie in its past way. So I even think this weaker assumption is more plausible. But I also think it works in the proof. Okay. okay. I'm not I'm sure, not sure. I understood the question. Um, okay, let me try to answer. Um, the, so, if I understood correctly, the proposal would be to replace this set lambda here, uh, the set gamma here, by one where W is before A. So I would only require independence of A from all values that are strictly in the past of A. Um, this is, is, of course, a um, mathematically consistent possible definition. Um, it has one property which is a little bit problematic. The property is the following. If you have a causal structure like the one I consider, like, for example, um, uh, let me go back to this particular slide. So we have this causal structure that is depicted here. If I now would require that if I choose A freely, it's only independent of these things here in the past, but not independent, for example, of B, then I could have a situation where A and B are perfectly correlated, let's say. Now, according to that definition, if A and B are perfectly correlated, but independent of these previous um, random variables, they would still be free, according to that weaker definition. Now, this would mean that two perfectly correlated, so if I had here, let's say, Alice and Bob, they would both, according to the definition, make a free choice. However, I would know that both make exactly the same choice. So I would naturally then say that at least one of them wasn't free. I mean, if two players who are kind of um, support, who both believe they make free choices, always make the free, make the same choice, um, I would then say that would mean that it, um, at least one of them wasn't free. So therefore, my definition of freedom was probably too weak. That would be, um, let's say, uh, a short answer if I understood the question correctly. Um, why a definition that would just require independence from previous events would, in my opinion, not be sufficient. Okay, that was my answer. Okay, here, here, any reaction? Yeah. Okay, thank you. If I could come back briefly without taking too much time. Uh, I would 
I agree with everything you said, but my suggestion was not independence of by A of what is in its past, but that A should be independent of what is space-like to A. So I agree that the pre-established harmony between A and B doesn't feel free, and I agree with the detail of your answer, but I'm making a different suggestion that actually your gamma, your big gamma, can be defined as a smaller set, not the set of the W's that are outside the future light cone of A, but as the W's that are in the elsewhere of A. That seems sufficient for the proof. Okay, okay. I think I now understood the question. Thanks. Um, so I would say um, that this, um, so what you suggest could be rephrased in this terminology that I introduced by introducing an arrow from A to Y. Because I, mean, the, I can put arrows as I like. This is just a different structure. But at the end, um, this structure, the only impact it has is that it changes at the end the, the set um, gamma that I have. So if I draw an arrow here from A to Y and an arrow from B to X, then um, free randomness or freeness, freedom of A would mean that A now has to be only independent of B because Y would now by definition be in the future. So I mean, this would just be an arrow. So it doesn't mean that it's in the, um, in the future light cone. But the, the, so in, in that case, I would indeed get a consistent definition of free choice again. It just, would just be the same definition, but with respect to a different causal structure. So that's why when I um, formulate the CRM, I have to make the structure explicit. However, I don't think that the CRM would still be valid if I change the causal structure to be one where I have an arrow from here to here. And the reason for that is that um, in the second step of the CRM, so um, let me go to the proof briefly. Um, in this second step of the proof, I we derive this statement, which is a statement that is derived in this work. And in, in this paper, if you look at it, you, you will see that it's important that the choice A is independent not only of B, but also of Y. And so indeed one could now say the theorem would, me, would be much stronger if I could replace the causal structure or this chronological structure by one where I had an arrow from here to here. However, I don't think it's true any longer. So we can, so the, the theorem requires that there is no arrow from here to here. Um, okay, so uh, Daniel had to leave, so I'm going to take over uh, the chairing duties. Um, if there's anybody um, who's actually in the Hangout who still has a question, um, then can you indicate in the chat room? Uh, in the meantime, we'll take another question uh, which came in from the live stream. Um, and I'm going to be unable to pronounce the person who asked this question's name properly, uh, so I apologize for that, but it's something like uh, Jigs League Water, um, who asks, can the prepared state also be a state in just two-dimensional Hilbert space, or does it need more dimensions? Uh, considering you want to apply a unitary transformation to it and then get a Bell state, which is usually n-squared dimensional. Okay, so the answer is um, there is no restriction on the Hilbert space um, we have in the theorem. So, um, if you can see the slide, so th this Hilbert space can be two dimensional. Now, um, it's of course known that for two dimensional Hilbert spaces, there are certain strange things happening which are generally not true for higher dimensional ones, particularly if I look at hidden variables. However, there is no problem arising here because at the end it's this unitary that maps um, the state into an at least four-dimensional Hilbert space. And so in some way the assumption of the Born rule to be valid is therefore an assumption about the four-dimensional space. So to summarize the answer, yes, H here can be two-dimensional. However, the validity of the Born rule is not restricted um, to two-dimensional spaces, even in that case. So it has still to hold 
for a higher dimensional Hilbert space. So this assumption here is not applied to that space here, but it's applied to the space I have after applying the isometry. Um, okay, thanks for that. Um, no, I don't, I don't see any other questions, uh, and we are, uh, we've gone over an hour, so I think now would be a good time to, uh, to conclude. So I'd like to uh, thank Renato again for, uh, for his talk, and thanks to everybody for showing up. Um, we'll have another Q Plus talk in November. I'm not sure exactly what the details of that are yet, but it will be announced on the Q Plus page. Um, so thanks everyone for showing up, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for thanks all of the emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I guess there's now a coffee break. Coffee break, exactly. You can have only water here. <laughs> water break. No, it doesn't. Ah, good. It co it goes on moon. It's here. Yeah. It's here. It's here. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thanks, uh, Renato. If you yeah, have any uh, comments about how the talk went that you'd like to let me or Daniel know about, then, then now is a good time. Oh, that's really well. Oh, yeah. Um, bye, bye, everyone. Huh? <laughs> bye, Andreas. Um, so. Uh, maybe you still want to write me your emotional question. Oh, well, uh, I mean, so I think the conclusion I came to with regard to uh, free choice was um, the only way I could think to do it is you have some primitive notion of what variables, the variables you want to be free are, um, and you only allow yourself to work with probabilities that are conditioned on those things and never introduce a sort of a joint probability distribution over those things. Um, from our previous discussions, you know, I know that we, I proposed several things that didn't work. <laughs> um, so it's a kind of difficult thing to, to, um, to come up with, but uh, what do you think about that proposal? Yeah, so, I, I think, I mean, the definitions that we were considering were, were mostly definitions where we kind of were relying on such a, a structure, kind of something like a sure. chronological structure. So this is, of course, a, a very different approach. And I, I would expect that it somehow would work if, but I mean, the question is kind of, is there a criterion for I mean, would the criterion for determining which are the choices you want to consider, couldn't that maybe also, again, be just formulated with a chronological structure? So maybe it would be, at the end, equivalent. Because we have this freedom of choice in the chronological structure. But the chronological structure could, I mean, if you come up with a certain setup where you say, this and this random variable is free, then I could probably, I mean, I don't know that, but that may be the case that I could draw a chronological structure and say, oh, this means in our notation that you are free with respect to that structure. But I may be wrong here. I don't want to make that. I, I don't think so, because, I mean, in particular, I'm not saying anything here about um, what things are conditionally independent of that choice. Um, I'm not saying, you know, for example, anything about what in the that space like separated things are are independent, or even that things in the past are independent. So under this definition, for example, the fact that there's no retrocausality would be an additional assumption that you would have to add. I mean, it's built into the usual frameworks, but but uh, it's not, it doesn't imply that. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I don't know, because obviously the, I mean, the main issue is that this the, this implication of parameter independence well, I think that most people who believe in non-local theories um, believe that the assumption of Bell's theorem that has to be given up is parameter independence and not 
outcome independence. I mean, it's much more natural to think that uh, somehow the choice of measurement is what is what influences the other system over there, um, rather than the outcome that's obtained. I mean, in fact, the whole distinction into parameter independence and outcome independence is a little bit artificial from that point of view. But um, you know, certainly, if you consider just sort of orthodox quantum theory, where you imagine that there's some real physical collapse of the wave function that happens and the quantum state is the state of reality, then it's parameter independence that that actually breaks down. Um, so, you know, this, this is the reason why me and probably some other people are reluctant to endorse the notion of free choice that implies that. Um, but you could even draw the, the arrows in the opposite direction if you want. So if you want to have retrocausality, I mean, because the arrows have no... Um, I, I know, but the, so, 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 I mean, of course you can draw the arrows however you like, but the point of the story is that then when proving a theorem, you prove it with respect to a causal structure which happens to be the one that's compatible with relativity. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So, so I mean, if you believe that the correct way of doing things, I mean, so, so obviously one always has two options. One is to say that the notion of free choice is, has to be replaced, and the other one is to say that actually you were wrong about what the causal structure is. Um, but I think that it's, I, I think that I don't think that most people are thinking that way. I think they're thinking that you can formulate. I think that they're, they're thinking that you can you can have a notion of what a free choice is within a causal, within a relativistic causal structure that just happens to allow for non-locality within that structure. So I think sort of a Bohmian, for instance wouldn't necessarily say that they have to, um, well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's, the, the point of the story is that I, I think you want, you certainly want to prove theorems that are applicable to, you know, as, to include as many possible theories within your, within the scope of it as possible. So if, if there's a theory which either disagrees with the notion of free choice that you have or disagrees with the causal structure, then uh, ideally you want to you want to generalize if possible to incorporate those those theories within within what you're considering. Um, so from that point of view, you know things like Bohmian mechanics and the orthodox orthodox interpretation with collapse are, are problematic because they either say that that the causal structure is different or they say that. Uh, the free choice assumption is isn't quite right. Um, so I mean, this but, is the reason yeah. for thinking about this. But I would I would just I mean, what I try to do is to not associate to this chronological structure any other meaning. So it's of course true that when I apply to an experiment, I would go there and say that the fact that there are different measurement devices means there are cert a certain isolation I, I want to enforce by the experiment, and therefore I have a certain structure there. But in general, if I would, for example, talk to a Bohmian, I would just say, I perfectly accept that he thinks now of a different chrono chronological structure where if things are space-like separated, there may still be an arrow. And because in my, um, or at least in the work I'm now considering, there's no other meaning to that arrow. So he shouldn't be against drawing that arrow. The only implication that drawing that arrow has is that it changes the notion of free choice in the particular setup. Yes, well, I, so I think, a, but but you see, then you would have a causal diagram where you would have, in principle, a direct arrow between the two measurement choices. And I think a Bohmian yeah. still thinks that those can be made independently, right? And and that you can still yes. have a notion of freely choosing yes. those. But then we say, start, okay, then draw, don't draw an arrow between them, and that's then the structure. <laughs> I mean, I would, so what I've tried to say is that whatever he thinks, I could kind of represent that by arrows. And if he's then unhappy, then I wouldn't see a reason for it, because this is the only thing I want to capture by the arrows. I, the arrows just represent somehow is So I could even say that these arrows just represent the structure of the freedom you have in a particular problem. They have no other meanings. Maybe I shouldn't give them a name of 
the chronological structure. It's just a pre-order relation, and the pre-order relation is a way to characterize which things are supposed to be independent of others. So maybe it's just okay, too but, much. But if you really, if you really, do, I mean, do you really honestly think that if I make a choice over here, and it happens that there's something over there, something space-like separated from me, uh, some measurement outcome, which happens to depend on my choice here. I mean, do you really think that that means my choice wasn't free? I mean, it, it seems a bit, it seems that, I mean, it seems to me that the better thing to say there is that there was a no, non-local influence. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I certainly agree with you that if something's, you know, definitely in the past, and, well, okay, well, <laughs> I'm not even sure. Okay, I mean, as I said, I'm I'm ready to. Um, I mean, I, I think so like, I, 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 think, wrong. I, I think the basic beef that people has have is this, right? Um, obviously, we know from Bell's theorem that you can prove that a certain kind of non-locality exists. I mean, it happens that you can break that down into two assumptions, and it happens that. Most of the people who believe in non-locality think that one of those that the, the the most plausible assumption to go is the parameter independence one, and then you prove a theorem based on the idea that based on well one of the implications of the assumptions is that this has to hold, and so they're going to turn around and say well why should I believe that theorem because I I already think and already in the models that I that I consider. I already think that this is the this is an assumption that has to go, and then you kind of like want to say something like, well, you know, and you sort of said, well, our proof is more general or, or requires less assumptions than the PBR, but the PBR doesn't doesn't uh, imply any assumptions which people who believe in non-local solutions to you know the Bell's theorem dilemma uh, have to reject, so. That seems like a bit puzzling. It seems a bit puzzling to me. Yeah, but here I would not completely agree that it doesn't imply. I mean, of course, um, it's this is only because in, in when people talk about Bell, they make this distinction between choices of measurements and choices of um, of states. And it is true that if I make this distinction, then the assumptions look different. So I have weaker assumptions um, that are needed on the choices of measurements. And then the assumptions that I need for choices of states. And so, as soon as I make the distinction, it, the situation indeed looks different. So the the reason, in some way, why I could say that the same assumption, in some way, is implied by their thing is that I don't make a distinction between measurements, setting choices, and choices of state preparations. However, if you if you give up that distinction, then indeed it's really the same thing because if you look at what they um, what they have is that they choose a state somewhere, and if there was now signaling, I mean, if you now forget that this was just an initial state we chose, and it may have been a measurement setting, then if there was signaling, it would indeed in general influence the state in the other preparation device in principle. So it's just because you call it a state preparation, and because for state preparation you don't I mean, you kind of distinguish that conceptually from the rest. You impose different assumptions that you get something that is weaker. Well, I mean, I, I, so I agree with you that you can you can view that kind of assumption as something that comes from a free choice. I mean, as you explained, that you can view it as something, you know, just like parameter independences, you can view the PBR assumption as something that comes out of the, your free choice mm -hmm. assumption with some particular chronology. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the distinction is that that, I mean, so, so now we have, we're talking about two implications of, two different implications of the free choice assumption. Um, one of those implications happens to be something that many people think uh, needs to go because of Bell's theorem. The other one I mean, isn't it's, it's it's a particular implication of the free choice assumption? The point is that the free choice assumption is stronger than both of those particular cases. Um, ah, here would not. So what I tried to show is that the free choice assumption that we, I mean, I agree that in general the free choice assumption has different, let's say, in the Bell terminology, different implications because you make the distinction between parameters that you choose and between 
states, Jews and other things. But what I showed, or what I can show, is that if you take this independent state preparation, then it, this implies a certain, this implies that these files are chosen freely. It doesn't, with respect to this particular causal structure. So, um, I mean, of course, words, that there is, so, so, I mean, one possible objection to that is that there is, I mean, so that's not the most general possible formulation of the assumption under which PBR holds. Now, so there's, you know, there are more general statements which, um, you know, aren't necessarily as well motivated. You know, it's it's not so sort of obvious why you would think of these conditions, but you can prove PBR under uh, as under less um, restrictive conditions on what the ontic state space is and what the probability distribution yes. is. So, you know, all you really need is that you don't need necessarily this Cartesian product structure. You can have some global state space. And all you really need is that um, if, oh, let me see how it, how it goes, if there's, uh, okay, basically if you take a tensor product of different, of, of different quantum states chosen from a set of two states, if you take one of those tensor product states, um, and if it happens that on an individual system, the probability distributions corresponding to the two states overlap, then uh, you should say that there's overlap between all of those states, all of those tensor product states as well. Um, now we're not saying how much overlap there is. We're not saying that those distributions has to be product. We're just saying that there has to be some non-zero um, overlap region between those states. Now, because you don't have like this product structure, it's not clear to me that that's uh, that's uh, going to imply some freedom of choice type of assumption. But I yeah, I absolutely agree with what you say. But then um, for a fair comparison, one of course has to also take into account that the theorem that I now presented could can of course be weakened. So for example, you don't need this. Um, freedom of choice in that strict form. So it's it's sufficient actually if, I mean, instead of saying that um, it's um, independent, it's just sufficient to say it's not deterministic. And that's actually a much weaker assumption. So in the same way as, I mean, so now the freedom of choice says essentially that the measurement choices have to be independent of everything else, but it's sufficient if they're not completely determined by everything else, in some sense. Mm -hmm. And this is related to these results about randomness amplification. Sure. So essentially, um, it's, it can be arbitrarily weak. It's, of course, a different way of weakening it. But I absolutely agree that in both cases, for the PPR theorem and for ours, um, the assumptions can still be weakened, and then it's maybe harder to compare them. I, mean, I, I only, I mean, to be clear, I only claim in, in, the, in this particular formulation that we have here, and in the particular formulation they have in the, in the original paper there, I could say, make the statement that, um, the part, like that the free choice assumption applied, maybe I briefly showed it. Um, so the particular free choice assumption applied to this chronological order is implied by their independent preparation assumption. But uh, I agree with you that if you weaken that, then I don't, lo don't any longer get that free choice. But I could also weaken free choice in the theorem I presented here, although we mm -hmm. didn't do that. But uh, it's clear that it works in, to some extent because for similar theorems, it already worked. But I don't want to make a claim maybe about that. But it's well, I mean, just hard to compare if one now changes, let's say, I mean, I agree with what you say, but it, I don't, in that case, it's harder to kind of compare it, because then I would also have to weaken that one. I mean, I, I guess I should mention that I'm, I should probably mention that I'm now coming towards the opinion where um, I don't think that the assumption, that the PBR assumptions are all that reasonable. So I, I don't necessarily want to argue that, uh, you know, PBR 
is a good theorem for establishing the reality of the wave function and yours isn't. My my real opinion is more like neither of them are <laughs> neither of them really uh, plausibly established the reality of the wave function. But um, uh, so I mean I guess this question of you know which theorem's stronger, which assumptions are more reasonable, are, is is becoming a bit moot because I you know my real opinion is that neither set of assumptions is uh, is is uh, particularly plausible, um, but yeah. yeah. But yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure we can come to a definite conclusion now, but um, I think um, so. My own opinion is also that this freedom of choice assumption that we are using is a relatively strong assumption, and that's why I'm so interested in in kind of seeing different assumptions. So if I mean, you mentioned one, but let's say, I'm not sure whether this, you now just mentioned that or whether you have some more precise version in mind of it. So I'm definitely open towards everything that... I, I don't think that you'll be... I mean, the, part, the point of me giving that definition is precisely that I don't think it really implies anything uh, substantive, you know, for these types of theorems. So, you know, my idea was to just say, Okay, let's look at like some network of the variables that are involved in our experiment. We have some kind of pre-existing primitive notion of which one of the, which things of those represent things like knob settings. Right? We know that you know A is something that is supposed to represent the experimental knob setting. Um, and so, what I want to do there is to say, okay, well, if a variable is a free choice in that sense, it represents a knob setting, then I'm only going to allow myself to write, and this is like basically what, what we do in, you know, in Bell's theorem derivations, I'm only going to allow myself to look at the conditional probabilities of everything else given, given those free variables. Now that, of course, allows me, if I want to write down a joint distribution, it allows me to Put any probability distribution I like on those on those uh, on those variables, but I'm just never going to formulate my argument in terms of that. Um, now, of course, I will need additional assumptions in order to um, rule out things like you know retrocausality and stuff like that, which I'll need to say prove Bell's theorem or, or whatever. Um, but I want to say that those assumptions are. I'm not going to call those assumptions free choice assumptions. I'm going to call them, you know, locality assumptions or no superdeterminism assumptions and things like that. Um, so I don't think it really. I mean, that notion of free choice is, you know, so weak as to not. I don't think it will really imply any. I mean, I mean, the reason what the fact that it's, the reason why it's so weak is because I'm looking. For, <laughs> I was essentially trying to come up with a notion of free choice that doesn't imply anything. Um, okay. But uh, of course it should still kind of intuitively capture what we would think is a free choice in some way. And so then the question is, in what sense does it? Well, it does in the following sense, in the sense that now my ontological model predicts c conditional probabilities of everything else that happens given the free choices, right? So that, so I'm free to set those variables however I like, um, and then the theory get, just gives predictions for everything else. Um, so that's the sense in which it's, you know, you know, if a variable's free, then, um, you know, arguably it shouldn't even have a probability distribution. You know, it should be, you know, if something really can be set however we like, then you could for example, even choose to set those variables adversarially if you mm -hmm. wanted to. Mm -hmm. right? You could have Alice choosing variable A and Bob choosing variable B, and you could say that, um, you know, that if they're setting their choices of variables adversarially as in a sort of game theory type of setup, then it wouldn't even be correct to talk about having probability distributions over them. Um, so that that's, I, I guess, the sense in which Mm -hmm. which okay, but okay. Maybe I have always the the hope that it would a definition would somehow. I guess you don't want that, but a definition would somehow exclude the possibility that a choice that I make is correlated to things that are clearly in the past. Mm 
but that would not, I mean, I guess you, you don't even aim at such a thing because it would just say, if, as long as I don't define these past things to be other choices, I don't care. It could even be retro causal yeah, yeah, so, events. I mean, I only care that they're, I only really care that they're not dependent on other choices in the past. Yes, uh, okay. Um, I, yeah, because I am open to yes. retro causality. Of course, you okay, would have to rule. You you do have yes. to write down conditions that rule out such influences in order to prove theorems. The question is whether you call those things yes. okay. free choice assumptions mm -hmm. or locality assumptions. It's, it's really a question of terminology. Yes. Yes. I need those extra assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so I, I I certainly agree that if you want to allow this retro causality, then the definition that we are considering is, is clearly too strong, does it? Well, I, mean, I don't see. Well, what I don't see is how you can come up with a definition. See, if I, 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 I think I would be okay if there was a definition which disallowed retro causality but allowed non-local influences. But from our previous discussion, yeah, this is it seems to me not possible. That this is not possible. Yes. So yes. therefore, I'll. I, I don't want to call a non-local influence, like a superluminal mm. influence, I don't want to call that mm. a violation of free choice. So I'd rather then adopt a definition which also allows okay. uh, the general influence. Okay, but I think here I would, I would agree with you. I think if one, I mean, that's of course a matter of taste, what one calls, what, how, but if one um, is ready to accept the definition which is not excluding retrocausality, then um, I think there are certainly many other possible definitions, including the one you suggest. Maybe the, the, maybe the hard question, or as I said, maybe the thing that is impossible is indeed the combination of the two. So if one has the requirement of having a definition that is not retrocausal, but on the other hand, still weaker than the definition that we have, then that's probably going to be very hard. So yes, there's probably well nothing in between. So maybe that, if one, we can say that's what I appreciated. That's what I appreciated from our previous discussion, which I didn't really appreciate before. Um, yes, yeah. probably there's just a space in between which is kind of open. Whether there's something weaker than our definition but not as weak as one that allows retrocausality. That would probably reconcile our two views because you would just say of course there is a very weak one, namely one that even ex yeah. includes retrocausality and I would absolutely agree with that. Of course, you also admit that uh, with that definition, it's probably hard to prove anything without additional assumptions, but I yeah, certainly I mean, agree so with that as well. <laughs> it's just a question of what you call those assumptions. Yes, yes, right. But maybe the technical question is really whether there is something useful in between. And I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe it's really true. <laughs> I mean, this is now just a feeling that it's hard to get something in between from our discussions. But maybe there is something nice in between. Well, okay. I mean, I think, yeah, so I mean, maybe one can form, I, I should imagine there's probably a no-go result to be formulated about that, but in order to get at that, one would have to be a bit more specific about what, mm -hmm. yes, in general, a free choice assumption has to look like. I mean, if we say, okay, it has to be formulated in terms of conditional independences, mm -hmm. um, it has to be, the free choice assumption has to be a conditional independence assumption that allows you to put in an independent product distribution for all the free variables. If you say something like that, then you'll probably find that there's no such assumption that uh, allows non-local. Then, you, then you could try and prove that if the assumption allows a non-local influence, then it also must allow a retrocausal influence or something like that. I should imagine that that you could probably prove that. <laughs> yes, yes, that um, that may be possible. That would be kind of be interesting. Of course, that would just I mean all these no-go results just mean that one has to look for completely different types of things, and it's of course a restriction to say that it has to be formulated in terms of con of probabilities and all that. But yeah. otherwise, I don't know what to prove. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I also don't see it as a, a necessary like I mean somehow. Or I only see this, these conditions as something necessary, not something that would kind of really capture free choices in the sense of, let's say, oh, sure. philosophical debate or something. 
But yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. There might be one. Could, I mean, the challenge that I put on is, of course, not very well formulated. But indeed, maybe if one could make that more precise. I just try to capture the idea that it should be somehow generic, because otherwise you can always say you just define this particular random variable to be free. That's kind of cheating. Yeah. So um, you know, I think I think in it in in the sort of specific example setups, like you know, the Bell's theorem yeah. setup. People have a very strong intuition yes. about yes. what it means for A and B to be yes. free there, and you know, in any other specific setup, ones that are related to like the existing no-go theorems, like mm -hmm. kosher spec or whatever, probably the same is true. Yes. People will say, "Well, ha, huh, well, freedom of choice." But then the interesting thing is to make this intuition um, kind of explicit, because I agree yeah. with what you say. In a specific setup, everyone would probably agree what what are the choices and so on. But how do you? Formalized. It's like the same way as we kind of intuitively talk about measurement devices and preparation. I mean, I think it would be very hard to define when you go to a lab which is now a measurement device and where is a unitary evolution and so on. But in practice, <laughs> it's clear what you well, mean. But that, that's, just a, that's just a limitation of the kind of operational framework that we often talk about. I mean, you know, there are operational frameworks which don't make that distinction and they're a bit more general. but. It just so happens that you know it's so clear what a preparation and the measurement is in, in many cases that it's that it's just inconvenient to go to that more general framework. I mean, so so generally you know everything has a, has a has a you know you just move to a framework where basically everything's a quantum instrument, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I just uh, want to do compare. It. I mean, it's kind of. Something that also most people would agree with intuitively, but when they have to come up with a definition, most people would have troubles defining what is a measurement device. I mean, I'm not saying that this is inherently unclear, but I, I think it's similar to what you said about choices, that it's somehow something that intuitively most people would agree with, but if one has to make it formal and say, what is the intuition based on? Is there a criterion you can spell out? Then it may be very hard. Yeah. Right. No. Oh, yes. But I agree. I mean, for a bell setup, yeah, it's kind of clear. But that's exactly the reason why I would really prefer to see a generic definition, which makes that intuition explicitly part of the definition and doesn't say this is just imposed from outside. Mm -hmm. but maybe this doesn't work. Huh? Maybe there is no free choice. <laughs> No, for, I mean, maybe it's just a hope that we can define that. But there's no reason. So it's just some some concept we make up as humans that we can choose certain things. For. Well, I mean, uh, I think what's more likely is that. I mean, so I, I think from your perspective. I mean, with, in terms of the Bell setup, if we take your definition of free choice, we can say that part of what we usually call locality is actually. It actually comes from free choice instead. Whereas my perspective would be, uh, what people usually call free choice in the in in the Bell experiment is actually free choice plus something extra. Um, you know, so the question is, I mean, the, and we've said this a few times already. I don't think that there's going to be a, a notion of free choice that's robust to generic scenarios that. You know, captures exactly that thing that we that people are thinking of as free choice in 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 the Bell scenario. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But to me, it's I don't care so much because I'm happy to call a no retrocausality assumption a no retrocausality assumption. You know, I don't not the kind of person who thinks you can't have any free will in a retrocausal world or anything. So, you know, I'm happy to call a you know. To call something what it is, and to just say, well, that's free choice plus plus no retro causality. Yeah. That yes. Anyway, um, I sort of need to be going now. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, me too. You have group seminar. It's already started. But. All right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your time. And. Yeah. And thanks for giving the talk. Yeah. And thank you. Okay. I think technically it worked all well. <laughs> I haven't seen. I mean, it's kind of strange to not have this direct feedback. But I 
got used to it during the talk. Because usually you just you get a lot of information from seeing the faces of the people who listen to you. Yeah, well, you can choose which. I mean, probably I don't know if Daniel told this, but you know, when you click on the. Yes, I, I saw it now. <laughs> so you, you uh, can click. You could, for example, have clicked on the like Cambridge, and then you would mm -hmm. have had yes. like a, a row of people in your window, which is some. I and mean, it's not obviously not not going to be as good as being in, there yes. in the room, but it's some some form of feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, but it was. I think it's. Yeah, it was kind of a nice experience, and it saved me a, a trip to Cambridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Okay. Well. Yeah. Thanks a lot, and have a nice afternoon. Yeah. You too. See you Bye. later.